So, uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Professor Juan Rivas. Uh, I, my, my research group uh, here in Stanford uh, works on power electronics, and I joined the university back in 2014. Um, so, so before I joined the university, actually Stanford didn't have a power electronics uh, like, like research group at all. So, so I got a chance to, to start it, and actually that, that uh, present some challenges, but also like, like immense opportunities that like, uh, particularly I uh, give me the, the chance to do whatever, whatever I want. Like I don't have to, to be uh, bound to like uh, somebody else's program or anything. So, so that has given uh, me and my students like a lot of freedom to, to experiment and, and particularly find applications. So I'm a, an application driven uh, engineer that like, I, I, like the most fulfilling part of like like uh, designing or building something is when it actually has an application. Um, a lot of respect for the theoreticians out there, but like 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 I I uh, in in my in, in my group we really, really try to like drive things home in uh, and and use them. So um, so so with that I I'm just going to start like I uh, please ask that uh, I, if at all point at any point you have any questions uh, just feel free to jump in. It's okay. I don't I don't mind. Uh, uh, like inter interrupting and try to keep it uh, as informal uh, as, as possible. Like, call me Juan, uh, and uh, happy to answer any questions if you have an agenda. So, so with that, so what um, we do is uh, power electronics, and most most of the time, like my experience, like when I start talking about power electronics to people, is that they think power supply which to a certain extent is true. So we design power supplies. We, uh, but when people think about power supply, usually the first one that comes to mind is like the, the one that is attached to your cell phone, to your uh, laptop. And, uh, and what I want to kind of convey, the message that I want to convey, it goes a lot more, more than that. Uh, so power converters are important because like a, a very large fraction of power electronics in general is important nowadays because a very large fraction of all the energy, the uh, pr electrical energy produced throughout the world passes at some point through a, some form of power converter. So, so it's important to make them efficient because like we don't want to waste energy, of course. And also it's important to make them uh, dense. So, so in, in my field, one of the most important metrics that, that there is is power density, like how small can you make a power converter for a given power? And this is important because when, when um, there's many applications that are limited by the size of the power supply, like for example, if the power supply that drives the, the, the motor in your electric car is too heavy or big, you can perhaps not go as fast or as fast as, as far as you would like. And similarly, like if the power supply of your laptop was, uh, uh, 30 pounds, you probably wouldn't take it with you on a trip or, or at least you're gonna have to pay extra. So, uh, but at this point, I just wish we could go ev everyone on any trip. <laughs> so, so uh, in, and, in, and in general, like when we th think about power electronics, we have few variables that we can use to make the uh, power supply more compact. So in uh, the ingredients to make any power supply uh, are uh, semiconductor, power semiconductor switches, and passive components, usually uh, inductors and capacitors. And uh, usually you have to set an arrangement of these devices on top of a, a printed circuit board that like uh, connect them together and you have kind of a working, working converter. And the semiconductor switches, we operate them as, as their name say, as switches. We turn them on and off. And it happens that like the faster you can turn them on and off, the smaller you can make your power supply. So, so there is an interest of uh, trying to go as fast as possible in switching frequency so that you can like reduce them like as, as much as you can. But uh, very soon you find that uh, this is, there is restrictions to how fast in frequency you can go. And, and in big part, this is due to uh, switching losses. So uh, these switches are not instantaneous. They take some time to turn on and turn off, and that leads to loss. So, so there's a, a, a limit on how fast you can turn them on. 
so on, on and off. So for example, uh, this is an example like here in the bottom. You can see uh, a paper that was published 10 years ago now and uh, shows how when uh, you design a converter, uh, all of these are about the same power, but when you design a converter that is operating at 72 kilohertz of switching frequency, the power density that you're able to achieve uh, for this design is about four and a half kilowatts per liter. So if you drastically increase the frequency to 250 kilohertz, it is noticeable that like your power density more than doubles to about 10 kilowatts per liter which is great. Now you have a much more compact system. So then uh, the authors here uh, double the switching frequency again to 500 kilohertz and the power density like now goes all the way to 13 kilowatts per meter, which is great. But like you can notice that like the increasing frequency from the, this first step to the second and from the second to the third, uh, like the increases in power density are starting to diminish. Like notice that like if I were to double the switching frequency again, which is not an easy task, it's particularly like difficult considering parasitics and other, other situations. Like if you were to double the switching frequency from 500 kilohertz to one megahertz, notice that the power density uh, only goes from 13 to 14 kilowatts per liter. So like a double in switching frequency does not necessarily translate in doubling of your power density. And that means that we're reaching a point of diminishing return. And like, uh, there are multiple reasons why this is happening. And uh, one that is very common to, to think of is again, switching losses as you turn on and off the switches faster, they dissipate more, more heat. When you dissipate more heat, you need to add larger uh, heat sinks to, to address, to address the, the issues of like increased temperatures. But another important component is uh, losses in magnetics. So as I mentioned, one of the components that we have in this print circuit board is in, in our inductors. And these inductors uh, usually consist of a magnetic core in which, uh, around which you wind a wire. It turns out that that magnetic coil is prone to losses. And uh, particularly, and those losses increase rapidly with frequency. So this is an example of perhaps one of the best materials out there uh, available for operation at higher frequencies. And like what we find is that like if you were to operate this magnetic material at a given magnetic flux density, uh, with just one of the parameters that we operated at, say at a frequency of two megahertz, you have this much uh, core losses per unit volume. But, and, and we're in this kind of like purple zone. And if, but if we were to design the same magnetic material to operate uh, 10 times faster at a higher switching frequency at 20 megahertz, you'll find that the power density, uh, the, so the power loss density in the material increases by more than an order of magnitude. So that is not good. So what that means is that like, again, you increase your switching frequency by a certain amount and your losses in your magnetic component increase even more which means that things are gonna get even hotter and then you need to do something to maintain the temperature uh, in acceptable levels. And that usually in magnetic materials is particularly difficult to cool them. So generally what we do is we just make them bigger. So like if you make them bigger, uh, you can operate at a, um, at a lower uh, magnetic, magnetic field density, which means that uh, it gets less hot, but you have a larger, larger component. So these losses in magnetic materials is really like one of the most important like reasons why we, it's difficult to keep increasing the switching frequency as we try to make power converters smaller. And turns out that we end up finding ourselves like in, in, this, in this like green curve here. As I mentioned, uh, when we are uh, trying to design a converter and make them uh, more compact, we increase the switching frequency. And when we do that, we have, um, like in improvements in power density. But then when we reach a frequency of a few hundreds of kilohertz, then we reach this point of diminishing return. And then when we reach this frequency past one megahertz or so, we find that the power density actually start going in the opposite direction, which means that things are start to get so uh, hot that you have to like severely derate the devices and make them much bigger. So that kind of like would normally indicate that this is the end of the road uh, of uh, 
using switching frequency as a variable to make things smaller, unless there are dramatic changes in technology or properties of materials or whatnot. But so one of the fundamental properties that, that uh, we deal with in power electronics, and I mentioned that here, is that the value of the inductors and capacitors that you use, this is fundamental. Uh, the values of the inductors and capacitors that you use vary inversely with the switching frequency, which means that like, if for some reason, like if we were to design a converter at higher and higher frequency, the values of those inductors become uh, smaller. If you design it conventionally, the losses in those components would force you to have to make them bigger in, in volume, but not in value. But, um, but if we're clever about this, like one of the things that we can do is uh, start making these inductors uh, uh, without using any magnetic core. So as I mentioned, like the, the reason these magnetic components become uh, like lossy is because losses in the magnetic material. So what if we just eliminate the magnetic material altogether? And this is possible to do, but it comes with costs. And particularly, I mean, there's a reason we generally people want to use magnetic cores, because that means that you can make a large volume inductor in a, in a small volume. But it's possible that like if the value of the inductor that you need is small enough, that you can make it out of a simple air core. So have no magnetic core altogether. And that will penalize you in power density, but it will completely eliminate this loss mechanism, which means that like now you can go back uh, at using the switching frequency as a means to improve the power density. But what it's necessary to do is that like in order, like because you're gonna uh, lose a lot of power density by virtue of not having a magnetic core, in order to gain back what you gave up by eliminating the magnetic core, now you need to operate at a much, much higher frequency instead of operating at like, say, one megahertz. In order for this to make sense, we need to be operating at frequencies of 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz and beyond. And this is extremely ch challenging to do from an engineering perspective, but a lot of, uh, give us a lot of research opportunities. And that's kind of like what we did and I, that we work on. Particularly, if we are able to make our uh, inductors out of like pretty much just a piece of wire, it means that we can also make them out of uh, pieces of like uh, metal on our printed circuit boards itself. So like instead of um, having a physical components that we add on top of a switching of a piece of printed circuit board, we can now engineer the printed circuit board to have traces that perform the function of that inductor. And, uh, and we can, like if we're clever, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with like printer circuit board technology, but it is possible to make printer circuit board with multiple layers of metal in inner layers. So it'd be possible to make all these inductors, capacitors and transformers in the, within the inner layers of a very thin printer circuit board in, in a way that like they, uh, they have a function. So think about like kind of like what happened. So like we go from um, from having a printed circuit board that is nothing more than a glorified connector that lets you connect the components that you put on top to each other to design a printed circuit board in which every trace matters. Every trace that you add is a circuit component that has a function. And that function is to uh, help you improve power density and make it easy to manufacture because making a printed circuit board is uh, at large volumes is incredibly uh, low cost nowadays. So, but in order to be able to do that, we have to do things, uh, have to be very clever about how we operate because like, as I mentioned, we also have switching losses in the semiconductors. So uh, this is a, a little, like, like a very common circuit, a common circuit that we use in power electronics. And again, I'm just gonna show the voltage and current uh, across, across this semiconductor. Ideally, we want them to operate at a switch. That means that it's either fully on and there's no voltage across it, but only current, or it's fully off and that there's no current and only voltage across it. And if you take the product of voltage and current across the terminals for that device, you can see how much power you are losing in that device. So ideally, if it's an ideal switch, you, you would experience no loss at all. And ideally, 
if all your components are uh, uh, have no parasitic losses, you could make something that is 100% efficient. But because of the non-idealities of the semiconductors, the fact that it takes they take their sweet time to turn on and off, you'll find that you always have uh, instant in time every time you turn off and off the switch, that you have an overlap of voltage and current in the semiconductor. And that leads to instantaneous switching loss. So you're going to have this blip of instantaneous switching loss every time you turn on and off the switch. And you notice that like if you were to uh, double the number of times you turn on and off the switch in a given period, that means that you would have more and more of this uh, switching loss, switching loss uh, little triangles here, which leads to a loss component that is proportional to frequency. If you were to increase the switching frequency 10 times, your switching losses would increase by 10 times. And that, that, that loss is something that you have to address as heat coming out of your power supply. So uh, again, this is one of the reasons we are limiting how fast we can go in switching frequency. So like one of the things that you can do though is use better materials, use uh, the most advanced of the best uh, new family of semiconductors that are called wide band gap semiconductors that uh, uses a new material like gallium nitride or silicon carbide that are, allows you to make semiconductor switches that are a thousand times faster. So like hopefully with that, you can like reduce the switching losses a thousand times and everything will be great. But it turns out that that is not the case at all. And so for example, uh, here is a, a plot that shows the heat density that you would need to extract from a power semiconductor when you're operating at a very common 400 volts voltage and you're operating at a frequency, uh, 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 frequencies in, in this range. So you can see that even when operating at a frequency of a uh, few hundreds of kilohertz, let's say 100 kilohertz, the heat density that you need to be able to extract, like uh, the heat that passes through your semiconductor that you need to be able to ex extract, it's comparable to the, to, the, to the heat density that you encounter in a full, fully working CPU. And you know that like the CPU nowadays are incredibly hot and they need like massive heat sinks if you were to open your, um, your desktop or laptop, you'll see that like you need to have like this, uh, super complicated heatsink to extract the heat. But now look what happens if you start operating at a frequency, as I mentioned, that like I want to operate at in order to like eliminate magnetic cores altogether. I'm proposing operating at frequencies of 20, 30, 40 megahertz. So you can see that like if you just were to do this, the heat density that like you need to extract of your, of your um, semiconductor probably means that you won't be able to do this. It means that this is going to get so ridiculously hot that something is going to melt and sure you will. So, so what gives? So what, what it means is that like we need to completely change the way we design power conversion. Particularly, we need to, as always, well, for something great we do in academia is make things more complicated. So like we can uh, add more inductors and capacitors in the network to make the, operate, the converter operate in what is called a resonant, resonant mode, which means that like, so, so these inductors and capacitors like set up conditions that you can solve using uh, differential equations in a way that uh, we make a circuit that when we turn off the switch, the voltage across the semiconductor will be determined by the other components in the network. And this component will act to pretty much make the voltage ring in this specific way, like, like have a, a, ring, uh, a ring to it, in a way that the voltage across the semiconductor would naturally become zero by the time you have to turn the switch on again. So what that means is that like, if we are able to make the voltage across semiconductor go to zero before current starts conducting through it again, that means that we can, by operating resonantly, we can completely eliminate this over voltage, so this overlap of voltage and current across the semiconductor that was limiting us in operation. So by, by operating things this way, we can, for the most part, completely eliminate switching losses, which allow us to operate at this tens of megahertz of frequency that I'm proposing. 
So let's assume that we're able to do this, that like, we know how to design this converter, and, and, and we do for, to a large extent. So we can now operate at these frequencies of tens of megahertz. So now we're in, we, we are in that uh, frequency range. Now we can completely eliminate magnetic cores. So now, how do we make these inductors? How do they look like? Well, they look something like this. So now we can make, uh, use traces on a print circuit board. We can make like, it's like funky little uh, spiral to make it work like an inductor, uh, which is okay. Similarly, we can use a little piece of plastic and just wind a, tor uh, a wire around it and like that sets up some inductance. But we actually prefer to have things a little more uh, engineered. So what we can do is like, is, is making a solenoid, but making it go around a printer circuit board and make it bite its own tail, if you think about that. And the reason we do that is that like this structure allow us to confine the magnetic field generated by the current traveling to this component to be confined to within the, the volume of the torus. And this is actually clearly shown here that when by using an FEM simulation, we can see the magnetic field external to these three structures. So it becomes evident that like on top of the, um, the toroid, you have the least amount, least amount of magnetic field ex external to the structure. And that is important because like you don't want to have magnetic fields inadvertently reaching other places and, and contributing to, um, to electromagnetic interference. So, um, this is kind of like the stuff that we've done in my lab in the past few years. So that we are designing pre circuit board and all the components in it. And like we have demonstrated uh, effectively. So like this is an example of a, a converter that like delivers about 300, 300 watts that is operating at a frequency of 27 megahertz in which all the inductors and capacitors are implemented using simple traces on a pre circuit board. So like by you doing a kind of like sophisticated but like not impossible layout on a print circuit board, you can deliver hundreds of watts in something that pretty much has no external component, which means that like, I think that has an opportunity to make things lower cost uh, and, and, and better. And there's still a lot of things that we need to, to, to deal with. Like we need to deal with like external magnetic fields and whatnot. But if you have like these uh, questions uh, later or one more details, you can reach out. So, but it turns out that this is not ideal by no means. So for example, like, like the one each one of this inductor that I show here, this is kind of like what you have in mind when you design an inductor. So you, you, you provide a structuring with the current travels around and establish a magnetic field and produce some inductance. But in practice, that's not what you have. This is what you get. He's on the right. It's like, if we were to remove all the uh, green, uh, FR4, like the, the, the fiber, fiberglass like mesh, the metal that we are left with is this toroidal structure and doesn't look like what we had in mind. And this is far from ideal for many reasons. First of all, you know that like currents don't like to travel in, uh, they, they, they always look the path for this resistance and having 90 degrees sharp edges at every corner is something that they don't favor. So similarly, uh, when you connect the top and bottom layers of your uh, PCB to make this toroid, you cannot do that with a solid connection. Instead, you have to connect a series of vias that connect the top and bottom layer. And that leaves a lot of like empty space between them that like increases, like makes the, 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 the path for the current to have higher resistance, but also it makes opportunities for the magnetic fields to leak out. And again, that's something that we, we, we don't like. So uh, we, we start looking around and we realized that like people had actually described that, you know, like perhaps the current flowing in a square cross section, this, this is what you could get if you were to slice this in the uh, toroid. This, the rectangular cross section of a toroid is not the best to conduct current in this type of structure. So someone did actually, someone calculated what would be the optimal cross sections that you would need to have in order to have an inductor that has minimum loss? So, like, what we realized though is that like we were in a in a in a point that we can like leverage technology in different ways. So, like, uh, if if you ever had like a class on um, electromagnetics, there is a concept that like uh, you perhaps have heard 
that is called uh, skin death, like skin effect, which, which uh, indicates that um, like uh, currents do not flow, they don't like to flow, AC currents, I, the, I mean like uh, alternating currents, don't like to flow deep into a metal. They actually get constrained to a very thin layer at the surface of the metal, which means that, and, and how deep they can travel within the metal depends on the frequency that they're operating at. And as you go higher in frequency, this uh, skin effect becomes shallower and shallower, which means that at the frequency that we're op uh, proposing operating, like, like 10 megahertz or so, the thickness in which the current travels from the surface of the conductor is only tw a few, like few tenths of microns, which means that like if you were to make this out of like metal, uh, you're are actually not even using most of the metal. You're only using a tiny, tiny la little layer, at, uh, a very thin layer at the top of the, uh, at, at, uh, at the surface of this uh, structure. So we thought perhaps we can 3D print that. So that's kind of like what we did. So like we uh, computed, calculated what this optimal cross-section for an inductor would be. And then like we put it inside a computer. So like we uh, develop, a, we hij hijack a program that is normally used to make cell phone cases in GALA. So like we, they use them to, like, to, to make cell phone cases, like we use it to design inductors in a parametric way. So we can change all the parameters that we want. And then like, we take this, we generate a 3D, 3D file that we, we can import into uh, FEM um, software to, to study the magnetic fields in the structure. Now that we can predict the value of the inductor, inductance and quality that if we would get, and let's say we get for this particular inductor, we get these parameter values, then we can proceed and just 3D print it. So like we can get a low cost 3D printed and print 3D printed as a scaffold. And again, this is not conductive. So, so we still need to do, uh, but it's very lightweight when we use a low cost 3D printer. And then we can have like a simple process to electroplate. So like we can electroplate it like with perhaps 20, 30 microns of copper on top and have a component that is incredibly lightweight because mostly there's no metal, just like a tiny little uh, layer at the surface. And uh, we're able to obtain the inductance and quality factors that we need at a very, very low weight. And like, uh, I'm not gonna go into the business of uh, designing inductors only, like I'm not that interested in that. I'm more interested in see if we can design full-fledged converters this way. So one of the things that we've been trying to do like in the past few years is see if we can come up with the structures that we can just 3D print and in one shot have all the inductors that we need to make uh, pretty much print, print them like pancakes. So like we can use a low cost 3D printer, uh, printing all the scaffolds with all the components that we need and have uh, a, a working converter. So that's what we did. So like this particular converter is a resonant converter that operates at 27 megahertz. The scaffold, the plastic scaffold that has three um, inductors that like different values all connected together, the scaffold itself only weights about one gram. And then we can like uh, uh, plate it and then add a semiconductor somewhere in here. And we end up with a power convert that like now, when we implemented using the, the PCB this description that I had before, used to weigh 10 grams, which is still very little. But like now we're able to shed half of the weight and, and bring them down into the five grams like we are. And you may, you may wonder like, so why is he building this uh, weird looking converse for? This is actually uh, made to strike a plasma. So like this uh, power supply delivers uh, radio frequencies uh, power about like uh, 50 watts of it. And uh, it's able to um, ionize uh, novel gas in this case is argon and like we use it to to strike a plasma it's super bright like you can barely see this like like the, the photograph doesn't do justice of how bright this is and uh, this is done with something that is operates very efficiently and weights very little and you may ask like okay and why is he using the plasma for well it turns out that we use them for for making uh rockets we are trying we're um we started a collaboration with like uh, Australian National University 
that we're trying to develop uh, satellite thrusters, like plasma thrusters, to be able to keep uh, small satellites in orbit longer. So like nowadays, if uh, you happen to, to have an extra few hundred thousand dollars, now it's actually possible for you to send a satellite into lower orbit. You can uh, like, like either participate in some like uh, academic programs with NASA, or you can just do it on your own with like, if you, you have a, a buddy in, in SpaceX and whatnot, and you can convince them to send your CubeSat to the International Space Station. Uh, at that point, like an astronaut in a space station at some point would put him in a catapult launcher that they have in the space station and they just like sent your satellite in a slingshot to, uh, to go around the Earth in a low Earth orbit. And that's great. But that satellite will only last about a month because uh, at the altitude where the space station lives, there's still some friction and drag. And like after several orbits, your, your small CubeSat start losing a velocity and then it just become a nice shooting star. So, so uh, there's interest that like if you were to send assets into space to make say like an internet connectivity or if you want to have like a, like a system of like sensors to be able to monitor things around the earth, you would like to have those uh, satellites last longer. And in order to uh, counter, counteract the effects of drag, what you need is a rocket. But you can imagine that making something that is very compact turning into a rocket is really hard. So normally people don't use chemical rockets. Instead, they use uh, plasma rockets and the Australian National University developed one. But they didn't have a power supply to power it, so that's what we did. So we, we uh, put together, uh, we, we, we put together one of these power supply that we designed. Originally, we started with a 3D printed one, but like then we realized that it had some issues with like surviving, um, surviving um, vibration forces in, uh, in practice. So we went back to, to build it uh, using a pre-circuit board because it gives us a much more robust, solid uh, frame. So, so that's what we did. So we put all the, all the uh, components together, we packaged together. We put it in a mock-up CubeSat. So this is the, the CubeSat measure 10 centimeters on the side. Uh, our, our friends in ANU uh, put together the, the, the propellant distribution network like system. And we uh, show it in a, in a vacuum chamber. So like we're able to uh, start with battery voltages and generate RF that like turns the propellant into a plasma that can be used to propel things into space, which is kind of like cool. So, uh, and, and again, you can see that this is an application that perhaps doesn't come to mind when you, you think about power electronics. Do you guys have any questions? So I guess I have two questions on what you talked about before and then one relating to this. Mm -hmm. um, the first was kind of, um, actually you kind of answered the first one. Uh, it was on like, you need special PCB technology in order to design those magnetic components. Uh, like, can you just do it with a DF or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we use, we mo for the most part, we use like the cheapest PCBs that we can get. Uh, there are some instances that like, we, we need to go to a, like a fancier, more expensive uh, um, system. And I'm actually going to show one at the end. But but like in general, like, like I do it, I'm cheap. I try to get the cheap one we, we can get. Awesome. And also I was curious on the 3D printed inductors. You mentioned uh -huh. that you had to plate them with the metal. Um, mm -hmm. is, do certain uh, plating methods work better at these megahertz frequencies or how yes. do you do that? The, the, best the best plating method to use is the one that you don't use, the, the one that you don't do yourself. So like we, we realize that um, plating is like a magic art. Like it's, it's, it's witchcraft. So like, like we tried to do that, we tried to do that ourselves in the lab and like we had like a very low success rate, like about like 20% of the attempts that we were trying to like play things were possibly decent, right? But like then we uh, started saying like, no, this is just not working. So we, we found a guy and like, like it sounds like sketchy, but it was as sketchy as, as, it, as it sounds. We just found a guy that like got excited about this project that started doing this for free. So like the guy, the guy lives in Pennsylvania. For years, we've been sending him like scaffolds to electroplate and he has never charged anything. 
Like he's been doing it for free. We don't know how he do it. I don't ask. And like, like, but, but like, I, I, I realized that like, it's like, I don't recall ever sending a, a payment for this guy. And the guy was like, oh no, it's fine. I'm like, okay, good. So I, I would just keep it like that. <laughs> But plating is hard, and that's not our thing. Like I, I don't, I don't. We we try several times, and we just like quit on on the plating ourselves thing. Uh, someone pointed at me that like like perhaps the people that I should talk to is that people that make uh, like faucets. So like apparently, apparently like 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 uh, coal and those those places that like outlets that that make uh, faucets, they usually use. Uh, like plastics and then like electroplating with copper in very very high quality in very intri intricate surfaces so that's something that is in kind of like the list of things that i will eventually do at some point but like i we haven't really approached any of that yet very fascinating thanks and i guess my On final cost. question was sure. um, how does heat dissipation work in something like a 1u spacecraft where you don't really have air this is a 1u so, so so like what we wanted to show like this is just a show off like we haven't we're trying to find opportunities to put one into space, but like it, it's it's hard and it takes years because like we need to qualify and find a lot of tests. But like, and also that's not what we do. Like this is like the the group that we're working with in, in Australia are the ones that are like trying to to pack put it in a in a satellite. We're just trying to provide the the power supply. Uh, what it's kind of like cool about about uh, like this is that we are able to make the whole power supply replace one of the sides of the CubeSat. So technically it's not using any space. So like a CubeSat needs a frame, like needs like surface, like, like on all the sides. And, and we were just pretty much utilizing the, the, the wall better. And we are able to demonstrate that we can like make a plasma rocket and still have enough space inside this one U to actually put more uh, devices. We didn't. We were just trying to measure trust, thrust, but, but like that's that's and and it's still this is ongoing. Like 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 we have demonstrated thrust, but like we we still don't have a full 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 cube. Cool. So do you envision heat dissipation to be a problem? Um, uh, no, this works in vacuum. This really works in vacuum. So like like the the so so I mean we're not trying to make this power supply the smallest we could. Like actually like. This should putting in the whole frame of the cubes that was a good idea because that manages the heat well. And, uh, but like yeah, in, in vacuum, it's, it's uh, thermal considerations are incredibly difficult and important. Too. Like we, we, we did so many crazy things on this, like we put a battery in a vacuum chamber and we were risking contaminating the vacuum chamber, but like, like we did and it worked and it didn't explode. Very interesting, thank you very much. No problem. So we so, have uh, one more question, Juan, sure. um, and Luke, if you want to go ahead and unmute and video. Um, it was a question about efficiency. So Luke, I don't know if you've got your answer or if you had wanted to elaborate on, but go ahead. And I had yep. you go ahead and mute and unvideo. That would be great. Yeah. Hey, Professor. Sorry, I came a little late. I wanted to ask, what's mm -hmm. the efficiency of the power inverter? Uh, which power inverter? Uh, oh, the the RF generators? Yes. So, so the, the by itself is about like 95%, 94, 95%. Uh, the DC to RF, and, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll show some numbers and efficiency in a little bit. Yeah, so in vacuum, like the thermal junction um, coefficient is very, very low, right? So yeah, it's, it is really a problem. Like, like I mean, I mean um, so, so uh, the, the team in our friends in Australia were the ones doing the thermal design, and they, uh, I think, they have uh, like mechanisms to to cool, to dissipate heat to a certain extent. They put us a budget. I don't remember how much the maximum power dissipation that we can incur, but they put us a budget on like how much heat we can generate, and we we were under. Like we we operate this for like hours, so like it it will work. Curious what the temperature is that the case gets to. Is it? Uh, I I have it somewhere, but I didn't I didn't put it here. <laughs> but like it's it, <laughs> it 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 really it really was not an issue. Uh, yeah, ninety five percent. That's definitely yeah. cool. Thank you. No problem. 
So uh, I just want to show like a, uh, in a diff completely different topic. And again, I'm going to go a little faster here, just mostly because I want to go through the, the, the text so you can see what we're doing. So like, um, as I said before, like there hadn't been any power program in Stanford before. So, so like one of the important things that I need, needed to do was to like try to work on something that like is able to have an impact in a re relatively short amount of time. So like it made no sense to me to like try to, to make uh, conventional like, I don't know, like power supplies for uh, data centers or for solar, solar inverters or for things like that. Because there is a lot of people working on it and they've been working on it for a long time. So just thinking that like, you know, I can come to Stanford and like get a, a, a a bunch of people that as brilliant as they can be uh, getting to the point in which we can build up experience and start contributing to the point that we can make a difference. It takes a long time. So I didn't want to do that. So like instead we wanted to see if like the type of work that we were developing could allow us branch out in areas that other people are not working. And it turns out there's many, particularly it was in the, the realm of high voltage power supply. So like in industry, like this is a company called Bike or it's a large company that like they made incredibly dense power converters. Like they take a few hundred volts input and delivers like three or four volts for your, for your three, five volts to your uh, power computer. And they can achieve externally high efficiencies like 98% or so kilowatts of power in very low volumes. And, and it's, it's really amazing. But when you look at commercial high voltage power supplies, like the ones that you take few few volts on one side and you get thousands of volts on the out in the output the, the efficiencies suck like this is like things in the 50 60 percentage they have uh, power densities that instead of being in the kilowatts per cubic inch are in the single digit watts per cubic inch they're like bad in terms in that regard but like that is what's commercially available so we thought like, you know, perhaps there is something to the type of work that we're doing on high frequency to perhaps improve upon this metric. And it turns out that there is. So like uh, uh, back when I started to look sound like, like a long time ago in uh, 2013, uh, we um, like I, I presented, like we presented like some work that we built this, when we were starting to work at these frequencies, we, we built the first like 40 to 500 volts uh, high frequency power supply. And I'm not going to go into the in the circuits. I don't think there's a point on that here. But I'm just going to focus on one of the stages of the converter that is called a rectifier that takes the radio frequency signals and turn them back into DC. So we, when you do that, like as I mentioned, as one of the virtues of operating at very high frequencies, is that we can reduce the values of the inductors to the capacitors greatly. Greatly. We can make them tiny to the point that they're so tiny that we can actually afford to split it in two. So like uh, this capacitor now is so tiny, so I don't have, I don't mind having two of these capacitors uh, in series. So you connect a second one, a second capacitors in the return path for the current right here. But like the reason that you can do this at any frequency, it just happens that it only makes sense when you do this at high frequency uh, because the values become manageable. But like so at the frequencies that we're operating, the way we're connecting this capacitor, what this allows us to do is to have this right side of the circuit completely DC isolated from the from the left. And what that means, if you're not into circuit, the only thing with that you think you have to, to, to think about what this means is that this allows me to have a multi multitude of these rectifiers and be able to cascade them in series while connecting all the inputs in parallel and hence achieve voltage multiplication. So like if I have this output that gives me say 500 volts and I have 10 of them, now I have 5,000 volts. And, um, and it turns out that like this happened to work great for the type of applications that we were targeting. So this is an, uh, the first prototype that we came up with. It's still a little ugly, but like you'll see that it gets pretty really quick. So this is a 40 volts in to two kilovolts out, 27 megahertz converter. And, uh, and it has 12 of these individual rectifiers at the output, so we all put it together nicely. And we demonstrated an efficiency of over 90%. And again, this happens to be strikingly good compared to what we could find commercially. So like, but it's still not in the final nice shape. So like one of the students actually like did a, a try to put this whole thing together. 
And then like, so we bought one of those power supplies that I showed, the high voltage power supply that I showed earlier. So this is a 30 volts in to four kilovolts power supply, 250 watts. And the measured efficiency was 78%. So like my student built uh, uh, this high frequency converter, a 10 megahertz uh, converter that delivers the same amount of power, the same voltages, but uh, is the size and uh, the size of a credit card in in in, in area, and so it has the printed inductors and uh, the thickness of around four four uh, credit cards. Once you take into consideration everything, this that's that's all the heat sink you need. That's all you need. So it it works really great. It allows you to have something that is twenty to thirty times smaller in volume that way you can buy commercially. Not only that. It's super fast. So like this is a comparison of a, a test in which we're just like trying to measure how fast we can reach the nominal voltages of the power supply. And we find that these high frequency power supplies are infinitely faster than the commercial, uh, than the commercial power supply. So by the time this power supply is, it's on its way to try to reach its steady state voltage, our power supply like turns on super quick in like microseconds. So like we can have a power supply that not only is very compact, but like, 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 like let, let you send pulses of kilovolt voltages in about a microsecond. And you may ask, why do you want voltages that fast? Well, it turns out that there's a really cool process that we were aware of that is called pulse electric field clusterization. So if, if you have a pipe, so this is a pipe that you're passing water, water through it, let's say, and that water has, uh, bacteria, right? If you cut this pipe and turn them into electrodes and then applied pulses of around 20 to 50 kilovolts per centimeter across these electrodes, it happens that the electric field that you introduce into, the, into this liquid is so high that it just like ruptures the membranes of any bacteria that is living inside. And you can use this to pasteurize liquids. So, um, but like, remember, like, like you, your parents probably told you not to put to connect electricity when you in, near water. Well, there's a reason for it. <laughs> but it happens that like, like, if you were to keep this electric field for long, you would just vaporize. Like the, the losses in the in the in the liquid would be so high that everything would just vaporize. But if you, you only apply this pulse for about a few microseconds, you don't let the 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 temperature on the liquid to increase so much, but the electric field is high enough that ruptures the membranes of this, the bacteria that is living inside. And, and again, I wish I could have come up with this idea. I'll be very rich by now, but like, like uh, it's, it's not. So there's a, a, it's being commercialized by, by a company, it's a company called Diversified Technologies that do, has done this. That like, this is the size of the power supply, the size of a fridge, cost about $200,000. And it's pretty much all this is a power supply. And all the magic, like all this magic happens in this pipe on the side. This is where liquid flows in and out, and then they treat it here. They apply pulses that are about 50 microseconds, about 50,000 volts across this uh, little gap. And, it, and it's enormous, you can see. So we wanted to see if we could make the ghetto version of it. So like we, we, we built a tiny 100 watt, like the power supply that, that I showed you before. That like, like it's it's very it's very small. We put it in the lab. We use uh, like like the um, two two pipes uh, separated by a millimeter to pretty much to recreate the same effect. And we use it to see if we could treat water with it. So like we we take water from a pond, like we culture it for bacteria. Like we we uh, check bacteria content, and you find that there's bacteria and it's kind of like nasty. And then uh, we treat it with one pulse of this uh, pulse electric field. And it turns out that like now like the bacteria is kind of like gone, and uh, I still wouldn't drink it because <laughs> like the color is still green. Like, like it doesn't change the color; it just renders the bacteria inert. It turns to be like an efficient way to like like treat liquids. And we turn it turns out that that's how how, how they use this equipment. They use it to treat uh, in sewer plants. So like what they use is to like uh, render the liquids inert, and then they go and add chemicals to like try to treat it. And, do their thing to clean the water. So like, so we were kind of excited about this, but then we realized that it was a bad business. Um, 
particularly uh, if we are like trying to get like a way to get uh, treat water, there's a, there's a lot of competition, right? Like you, uh, a short trip to REI, if you like, you're into camping, you'll find that you can buy these like tiny UV lights that you can use to, um, to sterilize, to, to treat water or just to filter. Or also you can add two, two drops of chlorine in your liquid and like that's probably safer than all the way you're doing. So like we realize that like this is perhaps not the best market for like developing something like this. But instead we, we were looking for a liquid that like you could not treat with UV light, you could not treat with adding chlorine and it also wouldn't work by, by treating it with a filter. And we realized that there was one and it was milk. So it turns out that like in, in the rural, rural places, about 40% of the milk that is produced in rural farms, uh, you cannot sell it directly, you need to pasteurize. So like the way farmers do is like they collect milk, then take it on their motorcycle, bicycle or donkey, and then go into the city and like uh, give it to a distributor, like usually like Nestle or something like that. And like they pasteurize, process the milk and distribute. But because of road conditions, weather, uh, et cetera, about 40% of that milk gets bad and they have to like be dumped. And like you can imagine that it has an enormous cost to, uh, to the communities. So, like, so we thought like, what about if we make this kind of like pulse electric field pasteurization thing and make a unit that we can, can sit next to the cow. Like imagine like we can have like a solar, solar system that provides power to this thing and apply it like, like the, the farmer is milking his cow uh, or his or her cow. <laughs> and uh, the and um, the milk it's treated online directly, like in like next next to the, the, the animal, and it's uh, treated for bacteria to try to reduce the bacteria content to the point that the product can have a longer lifetime. We're not trying to make this uh, uh, to reduce the bacteria enough to make it for human consumption, because like I don't want to take that responsibility. I'm not qualified but we just want to be able to reduce the bacteria content so that like uh, the, the farmers have longer time to take the product into market without like, cough, and hopefully reducing the amount of matter of, 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 uh, of milk that is spoiled. So we, we tested that and we turns out that we were very good at, at like, it turns out it works, like we can reduce the bacteria content and last like longer. It's really difficult. Like we, we stopped doing this mostly because like you need like, people with expertise in areas that I don't, and like, for example, how to make testing with bacteria in terms of being way more difficult than I, we thought originally. But like, also it turns out that like doing this from a circuit perspective was very hard, particularly because like milk, it's about 300 times more conductive than tablet. So that little ghetto converter that I showed you before was just not, to, uh, not for the task. So we need to scale things up dramatically. So we need to increase the power to like the kilowatt level. So like this is a two kilowatt uh, high voltage pulse generator that we built for, for, for this project. But that this one worked. So it uh, has a uh, power density of around 250 watts per cubic inch. Again, it's now an order of magnitude better than anything that we could find commercially. And it's able to deliver pulses in microseconds fast enough to be using this type of uh, pulse electric field pasteurization. And it turns out to be very efficient. So then when we start computing how we stand in power density versus uh, commercial offering, this is where we found that perhaps we were hitting on something big. We realized that like now the technology that we can do is able to achieve, I mean, this is not incredibly fair comparison because like for one part, commercial systems have a lot more protection mechanisms that we are able to like provide in a prototype basis. But nonetheless, we are really far out in power density that level from uh, anything that we can find commercially. And like, uh, it turns out that like, it's exciting. So we, we did something also very exciting. So like one of the students take the same concept and he uh, took it bananas. Like he, he went like absolutely crazy on this. Like I'll show you why. So like, so he take it to an extreme. Like again, this is the input voltage for this power supply is 45 volts in. And he designed this system to deliver five kilovolts. And in between, he put a printer circuit board, a transformer that uses the, the, the two layers of this PCB board. And he do it in a way that then like he potted and put like fans, like the whole thing was super nice. 
But like what allows you to have is to have another layer of isolation through the use of this transformer to deliver these five kilovolts. And then he starts stacking them together to, uh, and he's putting together 20 of these stacked together to deliver pulses at the level of 100 kilovolts. And the reason that he wants to do that is again, uh, you take 40 volt, 45 volts input to deliver 100 kV, 100 kilovolts out at the kilowatt level. And, uh, and we started like noticing that again, again, in terms of power density, we were really, really out there from anything that we had found commercially. And uh, you may ask, and why now he wants 100 kilovolts? Well, we want it for X-ray. So, so like there's a lot of applications like in dental, medical, industrial research that require uh, high voltages for producing X-ray. And uh, this is in the voltages and current levels that we perhaps can make really well. And particularly the area that I'm interested in is um, CT scan. I don't know if any of you have had a uh, the, 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 to be inside a CT scanner. But like usually when you're in a CT scanner, you're placing this uh, machine and there is a gantry that, ha that rotates at very, very high speeds around the patient. And uh, how fast they can rotate the, the machine depends on the weight of the power supplies that are on it. So we want to see if it's possible to reduce the size about like 30 times of some of these uh, power supplies so that the, the gantry can be rotating uh, at a much faster, like, like higher speeds, and then reduce the amount of X-ray dosage that the patient receives. Uh, so that's kind of like one of the applications that we have. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is something that happens in the past couple of years, uh, and the work has been interrupted due to COVID for obvious reasons, but like, like uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll finish if you guys have any questions. Sorry, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm taking too long. So uh, there was a DARPA, like the Department of Defense, came up with a call for proposals for uh, making a very small power supplies, high voltage power supplies. So this is the, the specifications that they requested. They wanted something that was a third of a cubic centimeter, um, only 200 milliwatts, and about three kilovolts, and it had to weigh less than one gram. So we got really excited because we thought, like, you know, this is this is this is right in our 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 field of expertise. And uh, after three years, they wanted the the people that work on this project. They wanted to make this even more challenging goals. So we applied. Uh, we we submitted a proposal, and we didn't get it. And like one of the reasons that we didn't get the project, according from one of the reviewers was that they didn't thought, like they, they really liked the work that we had done on high voltage that I showed before, but they thought that they, they, they couldn't see a path for miniaturization to, to like scale down in power and size the work that we have presented before. And like the student that helped me write this proposal was beyond pale and like upset. So he asked me if he could work on it some free time on it and if I could give him a budget. So I gave him a thousand dollar budget. To, to like try to make this program on his own. And he did, and he built it. <laughs> and in his first attempt, he was able to actually meet and exceed the stage two of this DARPA program with a thousand bucks and a month of his time. And he, did, he, he didn't do it by like doing any, any new science or anything. He just did a very clever design. He used a point of circuit board, like a flexible PCB board, and made a very conventional high voltage circuit, like similar to what we described, and he just made it tiny. And then he just origami the hell of it to try to meet the, uh, like to, to meet the specifications for this, uh, for this program. In, in the process he broke, with, like there was like some issues with like some of the, and that's one of the reasons that they turned out to, to have different like metrics, but it's able to fit and exceed what he was expecting for that. And that was also very exciting. And in order to show it off and show it to the program managers in DARPA and tell them like, hey guys, you, you, you should have given us the money because we did it anyway for free. Uh, we wanted to show it in a very DARPA-esque way. So like what we did is like, we decided to test this in, uh, uh, in an, uh, using an electro uh, drone. An electro drone, uh, an electro I don't know if you're, it's a, something you're familiar with, it's pretty much like a patch that is insulated, but it has an interdigitated electrode. And when you apply a large voltage across it, you, it 
it, it can like stick electrostatically to surfaces. So we decided to put this on our drone. So we bought the cheap, the, the lightest drone we can buy on eBay that had a camera. And then like we put it together with the power supplies that we had and like the electro addition patch on top. And what we do this is to, uh, we use it to, uh, so that, that we are able to perch the, the drone into the ceiling and we're still recording. Uh, so, so like, instead of like hovering, using a drone to hover, to take some video for an extended period of time that takes an enormous amount of energy. Instead, we can like take it all the way to the ceiling, turn on the power supply, electrostatically perch it, turn off the motors, and it can get stay there indefinitely while still recording, and then just turn off the the turn off the high voltage power supply and then keep supply. So again, this is kind of like a, a, another area that it was completely not expected that we end up working, but like we we think that has a lot of potential for the type of. Work.